Hey, I'm Ryan and welcome to NAS Hacker. So do you want to know how an NES controller works? Because in this episode, I'll be explaining just that from both a hardware and a software perspective. There are a ton of different controller models that are compatible with the original Nintendo. And you're probably even aware of some of the weirder ones, like the Zapper Gun or the Power Glove. Despite their cosmetic differences, most controllers work the same way, with a couple of exceptions. This being the case, in this video, I'm going to focus on one controller model in particular, the NES-004 brick-style controller that shipped with the original Nintendo in the United States. I'll start with a brief overview of how to open one of these controllers so we can take a look inside. Then I'll explain how the electronics for the controller work to communicate button information back to the NES. Finally, I'll step you through an example 6502 assembly program that can be used to read the controller for an NES game. But before we get started, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. After that, let's grab our tools and see what's going on inside this model NES-004. In comparison to opening up an NES cartridge, opening up a controller is quite a bit easier. You don't even need a special screwdriver, just an appropriately sized Phillips will suffice. Turning the controller over, you'll encounter six screws, and it's just a matter of loosening them with your driver to decouple the front of the case from the back. These screws are super tiny, and they can sometimes be tough to turn, so be a bit careful here. I suggest trying to keep them in their sockets while detaching the two parts of the case, then carefully setting the back portion aside once it's come apart similar to the technique that I showed in the NES Carts Explained video. Further, the buttons and pads in the front of the controller will become loose once you've detached the two faces. Take care not to lose your A or B buttons and pay special attention to the position of the pads, just in case things get messed up and you have to put it all back together again. Finally, I advise being a bit careful when you're rooting around inside the controller. PCBs can sometimes have sharp edges, and it's possible to cut yourself when handling the internals of any electronic device. Okay, with the case open, let's turn our attention to the controller's electronics by taking a look at its PCB. Well, this is kind of underwhelming. If you compare it to that of a game cartridge, the NES-004 PCB is dead simple. There's a single integrated circuit and a bunch of multicolored wires coming from the cable into the board. The 4021 IC on the front of the board is a digital logic chip called an 8-bit parallel to serial shift register. Its job is to collect information coming from eight independent signals and report them back one at a time to an external computer. In this case, the eight independent signals each represent one of the eight buttons on the controller, the four D-pad directions along with the select, start, B, and A buttons. And the external computer is the NES itself, which can be programmed to send and receive data via the console's controller port. Each of the wires has a specific role, which can be determined by their color. The white and brown wires supply electrical power to the controller, with the white providing positive voltage and the brown providing the ground. The yellow, red, and orange wires are used to send data signals to and from the chip. On the NES-004 that I opened, the yellow wire is connected to the serial output pin, the one that sends data for each of the buttons back to the NES. The red and orange wires are connected to the data clock and latch pins, respectively. These are used by the NES to instruct the chip on how to record and then send that data. This is a little annoying, but depending on when or maybe where your controller was manufactured, the meaning for the red and yellow wires might be swapped. For my controller, it was pretty easy to figure out because the yellow wire was soldered into a pin on the board that was literally labeled out. Now that we have a decent grasp on what the wires mean and how that 4021 chip operates, we almost have enough information to explain exactly how this controller works. The only part that's missing is the function of the actual buttons. There are a lot of ways that you can talk binary using electronics, but the way that the NES hardware does it is via something called a digital signal. Specifically, the NES uses high and low voltages to denote the digits 1 and 0. Technically, a 1 is denoted by a voltage above some chosen threshold, and a 0 by a voltage below that same threshold. This provides much needed wiggle room as voltages can fluctuate over time for all sorts of reasons. The end result is that you can convert a messy real-world signal like voltage into a crisp and clean digital signal with a fair amount of reliability. This is pretty important if you want to build something super precise like a computer. 
With this in mind, you can probably already guess how the controller ends up sending the data for the buttons. It provides a high or low voltage representing a 1 or a 0, which is then interpreted by a game as a button either being pressed or not pressed. On the controller's circuit board, each of the buttons is represented by a switch. If the switch is on, then the 4021 chip will read one value, and if it's off, it'll read another. You might expect it to read a 1 when the switch is on and a 0 when it's off, but hilariously, it's the exact opposite. It turns out that it's a little easier, electronically, to have the resting state for a button be tied to a high voltage instead of a low. By default, the circuit keeps each button switch pulled up to a high voltage when the button isn't being pressed. This results in a high voltage being reported to the button's input pin on the 4021, which is interpreted as the binary value of 1. The other side of each switch is tied to ground. So when a button is pressed and the switch is closed, the entire data line is brought down to ground. Remember, ground is the lowest possible voltage on the board. So this means that the chip will read a low voltage on the data pin and interpret its value as a zero. Flipping the board over, we find eight dark gray pads near the bottom of the PCB. These are the physical switches for each of the eight buttons. Now, this is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, as you don't often come across switches like this in hobbyist electronics, but I'm pretty sure those switches are printed onto the board using a special type of graphite ink that's been painted over the copper. The silicone pads that sit atop the buttons on the front of the controller line up with these printed switches, and each pad has a little foot that matches up with the pattern printed on the board. When you press a button on the controller, the two pads come together, closing the circuit, and turning the switch on. This is the mechanism by which the controller converts the physical action of pressing a button into a digital signal that can be used by the NES. Along with some resistors near the top of the board that are used to safely pull the data lines up to a high voltage, those switches are the last piece of the puzzle. With the components now detailed, we can bring it all together to form a complete picture of how the hardware for this controller works. To read the button data from a controller, an NES game first sends a high voltage through the orange wire, which is connected to the latch pin on the controller's 4021 chip. When it detects a high voltage on that pin, the chip goes into what's called data collection mode. At this point, some of the buttons are being pressed and some of them aren't, which means that each of the switches on the PCB's controller are either open or closed, resulting in high or low voltages on the associated data lines. Each line is connected to one of eight input pins on the 4021, which interprets each high voltage as a 1 and each low voltage as a 0. After a short amount of time, the NES program that's reading the controller will bring the voltage on the orange wire low. This causes the 4021 to record the values for each of the data input pins and store the result into an internal 8-bit register. This also causes the 4021 to transition from data collection to data output mode. Once the chip is in output mode, the NES can read the state for each of the buttons from the controller's data wire. But only one button is reported at a time, and in order to get the values for all eight buttons, the NES must send a series of voltage pulses down the controller's red wire, which is connected to the 4021's clock pin. Each time the chip detects one of these pulses, it shifts the output value to match the next bit of its internal data register. This is where the chip gets the name shift register. By storing each bit off the data line prior to sending the clock pulses that shift the data, an NES game can get the state of all eight buttons from the controller's shift register and store the results somewhere in RAM. Oh, a quick side note, the NES also has special hardware that inverts incoming data from the controller. This means when it encounters a zero on the data line, it'll change that value to a one. In a similar fashion, if it encounters a one, it'll invert the value to a zero. It's this inverted value that gets reported to a game's software. Doing this inversion after reading the value off the controller is pretty clever, since it gives us the best of both worlds. The hardware is simplified via the use of high voltage resting states, which probably helped reduce costs during manufacturing, and game developers get to use sensible values to represent button presses. Okay, so this is roughly how the NES-004 hardware works, and how games interact with that hardware to read button values off the controller. With all this in mind, let's move on from the hardware and take a look at some actual 6502 assembly code that performs the process that I just described. So here's a procedure that I wrote that shows how to read the button information from the first controller port on the NES. Production code will be a bit more complex than this, but I decided to keep it simple so we could focus on the core concepts. 
If you've been following along with the 6502 assembly crash course series on the channel, then you'll recognize the first section of code as a simple RAM initialization routine. All I'm doing here is loading a value of 1 into the 6502's A register, then storing that value into RAM at zero page memory address 20. This address will be used to store the output value for the procedure. At the end of the routine, the data will contain a series of bits that will denote whether or not a button was being pressed when we sampled the values from the controller. There's also a very good reason why I'm setting the initial value to 1 here, but I'll get into that in a bit. The next section of the code is responsible for bringing the controller's latch voltage high and then subsequently bringing it back down to ground. Recall that when the controller's 4021 chip detects a high voltage on the latch, it'll go into data collection mode. And then when it sees the voltage go back down, it'll record all the button values and enter data output mode. The way that we accomplish this in code is by writing a series of values to memory address 4016. This is a special address on the NES known as a memory mapped input output register, or IO register for short. On line 7, we write the value of 1, which is still in the accumulator, to that register. This will cause the NES's hardware to bring the voltage high on the latch pins for both controller ports. On lines 8 and 9, we then load a value of 0 into the accumulator and write that value to 4016. As you've probably already figured out, this will cause the hardware to bring the voltage low on the latch pins. This process is often referred to as strobing, and after it's been performed, any controllers that are connected to the NES will have been initialized, with the button values placed into their internal shift registers. The next section of code is responsible for recording the data from the controller and storing the incoming bits to the procedure's output memory. This section of code uses a very common programming construct called a loop. Loops are useful when you need to repeat some set of instructions a certain number of times. And this is exactly the scenario we find ourselves in here. Roughly speaking, for each of the eight buttons, we need to repeat the following process. First, we need to read the current bit from the controller's data line. Then we need to store that bit into the procedure's output memory. And finally, we need to send a clock pulse to shift the controller's register so we can get the value for the next button. By running this simple set of steps eight times in a row, we can collect and store the values for all eight controller buttons. And once we collect all the data, the procedure's job is complete. Performing the task in assembly is pretty straightforward, so let's step through it. On line 12, I define a label called read underscore loop. Labels allow us to provide names to positions in the code. Here, the label specifically denotes the position for the first instruction of the loop's body on line 13. On this line, the program uses an LDA instruction to read a value from the 4016 register and store it into the accumulator. Doing so causes the NES's hardware to perform two actions. First, it reads and inverts the value from the controller's data line, storing the result into the first bit of the accumulator. Second, it sends a voltage pulse down the controller's clock line to shift the data in its register. All that's left is to take the data from the first bit of the accumulator and put it into the output memory. Line 14 uses an instruction called LSR, or logical shift right, to place the first bit of the accumulator into the processor's carry flag. If you're unfamiliar with the carry flag, just know that it's a special type of memory located in the processor itself that can either be set to a value of 0 or 1 by various instructions. If you want to learn more about it, I suggest watching the second part of my 6502 assembly crash course. Now that the bit is in the carry flag, the program can use the ROL or rotate left instruction to shift it into the procedure's output memory. ROL is a special instruction that shifts each of the bit at a memory location one position to the left. The instruction places the current value of the carry flag into the rightmost bit of the data, and replaces the carry with the value that got pushed off the end. The last instruction on line 16 is BCC, or branch if carry clear. This instruction allows us to change the flow of the program depending on the carry flag's current value. If the flag is equal to zero, or clear, then the program will jump to the given position. In this case, the read underscore loop label we defined on line 12. If the carry flag is equal to one, then the program won't jump and the procedure will proceed to the next instruction. This line represents what's called the condition for the loop. If the condition is true, then the loop will be repeated, and if it's false, then the program will break out of the loop and the flow of execution will continue. To see how this all works, let's step through a full example and show how a program reads all eight buttons. Let's assume that at the time that the button presses were recorded, the player was holding the right D-pad, up D-pad, and A buttons. By convention, an NES controller reports the button values in a very specific order. 
So at this point, the value of the controller's shift register will contain the following binary value. Starting from the top, the loop's LDA instruction loads the inverted button value from the controller's data line, stores it into the first bit of the accumulator, and then sends the clock pulse to advance the position of the controller's shift register. Next, the LSR instruction shifts the value from the accumulator into the carry flag, allowing the ROL instruction to shift it out of the carry flag and into the output memory. Additionally, the ROL shifts the last bit of the output data, the one that fell off the end, back into the carry flag. This newly set flag is then tested by the BCC instruction to determine whether or not the loop should continue. Since the carry is clear, the branch condition is true, and the program jumps back to line 13. The process continues, loading each individual bit associated with a button press into the procedure's output memory. At this point, it should start to make sense why we initialize that output value to 1. Every time the loop hits line 15, the ROL instruction shifts the leading bit of the memory off and into the carry flag. Notice how the one that we initially placed there keeps advancing, one position at a time towards the end of the byte. On the eighth iteration of the loop, the one falls off the end and is loaded into the carry flag. At this point, the output memory contains all eight bits that were read from the controller, so the procedure's job is done. And this time, when the BCC instruction checks the carry flag, the condition will fail and the loop will be broken. This causes the processor to advance to the next instruction, RTS, which exits the subroutine. As you can see, there's quite a bit going on behind the scenes when it comes to reading something as seemingly simple as the NES004 controller. I think this kind of stuff is really cool, and unlike contemporary electronics, it's actually feasible for us hobbyists to get a pretty deep understanding of both the hardware and the software. Thanks for watching Ness Hacker. If you enjoyed this episode, smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post the next video on the channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.